The last aspect of what we're talking about here with sin um, and the doctrine of sin is some words to be identified here, uh, important terms associated with sin. We went over depravity and also guilt last week, depravity and guilt. We talked about the meaning of depravity in uh, context of uh, original sin um, that we receive from our fathers, okay, all the way back to Adam. We talked about what the extent of that depravity is and how it corrupts us. We also talked about guilt and what that means. We're not talking about the feeling of guilt so much as the sentence of guilt when we talk about sin uh, like that. The feeling of guilt, uh, that bad feeling you get in your heart, in the pit of your stomach, um, in your mind, wherever you get it, um, where it grips your heart, where it grips your soul, uh, that is a secondary um, aspect of guilt but we talked about the um, deserving of punishment, of being guilty, okay? Guilt is incurred through self-chosen transgression, either on the part of mankind in Adam or on the part of the individual's chosen act of sin, we said. We talked about degrees of guilt last week as well, uh, where people um, sometimes um, know that they're sinning or they're, they don't know they're sinning, sins of ignorance and knowledge, sins of weakness and presumption, sins of incomplete and complete hard-heartedness. Um, those are good things to go over as well. Now we've come to number three uh, of these terms, the last of them, and that is the word penalty. The word penalty. We're going to talk about what the meaning of penalty is here because um, in actuality, once again, we've been talking about this kind of thing in our young couple Sunday school class um, with our children. Um, and I've brought this into um, uh, the discussion that we've been having here the past couple of times as well, um, where, you know, a penalty is something, um, well, we'll just go with the notes here. We'll talk about it, and then we'll discuss it. Uh, letter A, the meaning of penalty, number one, their pain or loss. The word in the blank is loss, which is directly inflicted by the lawgiver in vindication of his justice, which has been outraged by the violation of the law. Pain or loss, okay? And you can talk about uh, what we talk about with our children, loss of privileges, loss of position, um, loss of things. Uh, you know, you might take away, um, you know, a toy or something like that. People come to me as uh, parents of teenagers and they say, how can I control my teenager? I said, do they have a cell phone? Um, yeah. I said, well, that's how you control them. I said, well, just take that thing away. See what they'll do, backflips for you, all right, to get that thing back. So uh, take that thing away or other electronic devices. They'll do anything to earn those things back. I've been with the police department, the sheriff's office in particular, and the parents have asked them, what do you want us to do with our teenagers that are out of control that we just called you about? And they said, take everything out of their room, including the door on their room, and make them earn it all back, okay? And I was like, man, I've never heard that. My mom and dad just beat me, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and they said, do that too, you know. <laughs> I've heard, I heard the sheriff's deputy say that too. So, um, you know, but whoever is the lawgiver, okay, who is in charge, who is the authority, um, they can inflict pain or loss. This is penalty um, because of the outrage of the violation of the law. Number two, this would include natural consequences of sin. And there are natural consequences of sin, but that in no way exhausts the whole penalty. We'll talk about that in a second. Number three, punishment inflicted by law is not discipline nor remedial, but just retribution. We have discussed this up in the Sunday school class with our children as well. We've got two aspects of uh, discipline. You've got correction and punishment. Correction and punishment. Correction, a lot of times, um, does, does, not, uh, uh, does not inflict pain. It does not inflict loss or anything like that. It is putting the children, uh, your children or whoever it is, we're talking about kids at this point, uh, back on the right path because they have veered from the path, and it might not be on purpose. It might be something that is just childishness, okay? It's not outright rebellion, um, but it is childishness. And so uh, they get correction for that. But if it's rebellion, uh, then they receive punishment uh, for that. Um, so anyways, uh, discipline or correction, uh, it's not uh, that this is not what we're talking about when we talk about sin's penalty. Okay. It is just retribution. And so let's talk about a few more of the aspects 
of this, okay, we talk about the natural consequences of sin. Some people say, well, that's just my punishment. No, that's the consequences that are built in to the sinful actions, okay? Um, if I, oh, let's say, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, uh, uh, of a unique sin. There are no unique sins. Um, uh, I'll use the old standbys then. So if, uh, if I drink a lot, okay, I may get cirrhosis of the liver, okay? Well, that is a natural consequence of alcohol, okay, being ingested into the body. Now, there's a lot of natural consequences of ingesting things into our body. We understand, okay, uh, it could be alcohol, it could be uh, whatever. I mean, uh, run, the, run the roll. There's things that we take on a daily basis that our doctors told us to take that are going to have um, natural consequences as well, okay? So, um, I mean, th those, are, those things are consequences. Um, I always told my kids, once again, you may have told yours, you can choose whatever you want to do, but you can't choose the consequences. Those are built in to the sin. Those are built into your choice to do what you, whatever you're doing, okay? Um, if you want to, uh, you know, drive 100 miles an hour down the road, uh, then you're probably gonna you're probably gonna crash. Okay, um, not everybody, um, but you know, and you're probably if you crash, you're not. It's not gonna be good. Okay, uh, there's consequences. Um, for definitely coming up upon an immovable object at 100 miles an hour, um, there will be consequences for that. So you can't get around those things, okay? Um, and the natural consequences of sin are included, but not exhausting the whole penalty, okay? Yes, God puts in natural consequences to sin, okay? He tries to keep us from those things, okay? Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And, and if we don't understand that concept, we soon will because uh, we're going to reap the consequences. The Bible talks about sowing and reaping, right? That is a spiritual concept that you cannot get away from, okay? There are people that think that they're exception to the rule to that. But if we sow to the flesh, the Bible says of the flesh will reap corruption. If we sow to the spirit, will of the spirit reap life everlasting. And so we need to understand that sowing and reaping is a biblical principle, just so much as um, farmers know that sowing and reaping is, is a uh, physical uh, principle of agriculture as well. Uh, they, they put in the ground corn, they shouldn't expect to get beans, okay, and vice versa. Okay, you say, well, I know that corn, yeah, I know all about volunteer corn too, okay? I'm a Midwestern field walking boy, all right? Um, but uh, uh, we used to have to go through and take out the corn that wasn't supposed to be there. Anybody ever rogued corn? Yeah, anybody rogued corn? Yeah, all right. Hey, you got to have a discerning eye on that, okay? Uh, or you can just go through and cut down the whole row <laughs> uh, if you're not careful. So <laughs> you got to know what you're looking for. But <clears throat> um, some of you have walked beans before, okay? And uh, you've taken out volunteer corn and things like that. And I'm not talking about that, okay? We understand the principle of sowing and reaping. You sow, you ought to expect to reap, okay? Unless something uh, else has happened, obviously, uh, drought and disease and things like that. So, but that's a natural um, order of things. And so it is with sin as well, okay? There is a personal element, okay, um, in this. Uh, there is a holy wrath of the lawgiver that is God, okay? Uh, and that is only partially expressed by these natural consequences that God has built into that uh, on us personally. We, we, uh, we talk about sin as having baggage, okay? When we get saved, um, maybe we have lived in sin uh, up into our 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, I've, I've led people to the Lord on their deathbed. I've led people to the Lord, you know, as young as four and five years old. Um, you know, and it seems like... Um, yeah, um, a teenager or an elementary age young person might not have as much baggage as far as sin goes as somebody who has lived in sin a whole long time. Um, but there is always baggage, okay? There's always baggage. Um, but the longer we live in sin, the more baggage we have, and we have to deal with that, okay? And there's consequences to our sin. Um, there's consequences to our sin. Number three there, let's talk about that a little bit. Punishment inflicted by law is not discipline nor remedial. It is just retribution. It proceeds, um, it proceeds from the breaking of the law. Discipline proceeds from love. Okay, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. But punishment, punishment is different. That proceeds from justice, okay? And it's not intended to reform the offender. 
It's not reform. Okay, when God talks about the, the penalties uh, that we receive, okay, it's summed up in one word, death, all right? Um, that punishment, okay, is not to reform, all right? It's not primarily intended as a deterrent. It's not primarily intended as a preventative, okay? But that sometimes is, is, uh, is a result of our understanding that what we receive for um, our sin is death, okay? Uh, but uh, we're not punishing somebody. God is not punishing somebody for the good of the rest of society. Okay, that's not how it's, not how it's going. Punishment um, is, is not intended uh, for the person who deserves to be punished to do good to them. Okay, it's not meant to do good for them. Not punishment in its purest form. And that's what we're talking about here. Okay. The Bible says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Okay. That's not intended to do good for anybody. Okay. It's not intended to reform, not intended to somehow um, you know, prevent or deter. Okay. Punishment inflicted by law is not discipline, it's not a remedy, but it's just retribution. It's not a means, it is an end. Okay, it is an end. A murderer is not corrected by being put to death. It wasn't intended to be like that. And yet God said, uh, if a man shed man's blood, then by man shall his blood be shed. For an image of God made he man. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Okay, in verse 5. Capital punishment is a divine mandate. Okay, um, they are to be put to death. I saw um, in the uh, social media posts and things like that today that um, this law that the state of Indiana has, um, where if you're a drug dealer um, and you sell drugs uh, in the state of Indiana to somebody and it results in their death, uh, you can be prosecuted and uh, the judge was going to give them 20 to 40 years, had the leeway in order to do that. 20 to 40 years in prison, okay, for selling that results in death, okay. Now, putting somebody in jail, okay, for 20 to 40 years, um, is not um, a remedy for them, okay? It's, it's a punishment. It's a punishment. Somebody died because of what they did. And so they're going to be put away for however long the judge decides they're going to get put away for, okay? Now you can call it the good of the society or whatever. It's technically not. <coughs> In the sense that that person's not selling drugs anymore, it's good for society. But in the sense that... Uh, they're going to prison for 40 years or something like that. That does nobody any good, okay? As far as, you know, uh, trying, to, um, trying to reform the rest of society or something. Now, it should be looked at by other drug dealers and said, I better stop selling drugs. Okay, I better stop selling drugs. Because you know what? Um, people are overdosing every day. And they overdose on my drugs and they can po point back to me and say that I sold them those drugs, uh, then I'm going to go away. They said, um, the prosecutor today I read, so that's the eighth person since the law. They've been giving them all 40 years, Jared says. So that's the maximum amount they can give them. And, um, you know, somebody dies because of what you gave them, an illegal substance anyways, it's not supposed to be sold. There you go, okay? Um, people should pe probably pay attention to that, okay? And just like whatever gripped your heart when you got saved, Okay, um, realizing that there is a penalty for sin. There's a penalty for sin. Um, and whatever it was that brought you to salvation, that might have been a part of that. Um, I, I don't want to die and go to hell. I knew that. Um, I know that that is something that uh, definitely played a role in me getting saved. Um, I knew that God loved me. I knew that Jesus Christ died for me. Um, I might not have understood everything that that had implied in that uh, as a child, but I knew, I knew that much, okay? And I knew that I, can, I could not have to go to eternal death. I could go and have eternal life. And so there is that aspect of that as well. So, uh, but punishment inflicted by law is not discipline nor remedial, but just retribution. Now, Let's look at the character of, pen, of the penalty, the character of the penalty, and that is, once again, one word, and the Bible calls it death, 
okay? Once again, back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve had the one rule, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely what? Die. That was the penalty. That was it. And once again, I don't know if they understood what that meant. I have no idea um, if they had seen any animal die or anything like that. Or uh, It was a perfect environment that they had lived in. But they understood enough that they knew to when Satan came to Eve and asked her what will happen if you eat of that fruit. She said, well, God said in the day we eat of, we'll die. Okay. We'll die. Well, Satan said you won't die and lied about God's word. Okay, brought it into question, and then said once again that God is withholding something good from you uh, that you should have by your own right, and you should be a God yourself, knowing good and from evil. Okay, and if you eat that of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be as a God. And God doesn't want you to be that, and so why don't you go and partake of that? And she did, and she gave it to yeah, Adam. Okay, and the Bible says they did die. Okay. They did die. Some of you are reading through uh, the Bible and you began in Genesis. You read this account again um, last week probably if you began your Bible reading January 1. Um, here's Adam and Eve. Um, the Bible says Adam lived to be 930 years old and he died. He died. Okay. Um, he was old, lived a long time. Almost. Can you imagine almost living a thousand years? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> That's pretty incredible, all right? But he died. And they began to die as soon as they ate of the fruit. Okay, it was a process. And so we see here the character of penalty is in three different areas. Number one, it's in physical death. Physical death, the word in the blank is physical. And that is the separation of soul and body. Okay, the Bible says that God breathed in the nostrils of man and man became a living soul. Man became a living soul, made to live forever, okay? He has a soul uh, that is eternal. He has a soul uh, that will never die. He is an eternal being. God himself breathed into us his capability of eternal life, okay? He gave us as human beings that. Yes, we have this shell that we call a body, okay? And it's a, a wonderful mechanism, Okay, with the brain and the body and everything that goes into making up our body. But this is just the outer shell, right? I'm reminded of that every time we, we have a funeral here. Okay, or we have to go to the funeral home or something like that. I mean, it is, it is truly when you realize uh, when you're standing there that that's just a shell. That is not the life, okay? This was something that that life was in, okay, um, that God gave to us. And these things wear out. Uh, they get disease. They're very fragile. They're very frail. Uh, once again, we're probably the, the frailest of, of uh, a lot of the God's creation. I mean, you can take an ant and drop it from here. I mean, how many times of a body, body length is that ant dropping? Okay. But if I jump off this platform right now, I'll about break my ankle. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, we're frail. You drop an ant from this high, it's just going to run away, okay? Um, you know, I can slap a fly um, that flies up here all the time. He lives here in the church. Um, I can slap that fly and stuff, and, and uh, I'm making an impact on that thing, and he just shrugs it off and goes on. And yet, we can hardly take a, a punch like that without fall, falling down, okay? I mean, we're pretty, we're pretty frail when it comes down to it, and yet there's a lot of ways in which we're resilient, Okay, well, God get, made us in that way, and God made us in that manner. And, of course, when Adam and Eve and, and all these guys were um, first, when Adam and Eve were created and then everybody else was living, I mean, these guys lived, a th I mean, Methuselah, 969 years. And that's the one we have recorded. Yeah, that's the one we have recorded. There were probably people that lived a millennium or more, all right? Um, he's the one that we have that's that's uh, in, the, in the, you know, genealogies and stuff like that that says how long he lived, but there was probably people that lived longer, okay? Um, we're not told necessarily. He might have been the man that lived longest. We're not sure, okay? But um, they lived a, a thousand years. And then you come down to where Abraham was. Abraham lived 175 years. Uh, Isaac lived 180 years. Okay, these guys were still living quite a long time, and that's without hospitals, without medicine, uh, without uh, some of your vegan diets. Um, and I mean, 
nobody in here probably doesn't, uh, you know, or whatever. I mean, that's, that's eating uh, raw, uh, not raw, red meat is what I meant um, every day, you know, and stuff. So uh, they didn't have dentists. They didn't have any of that. They're living 180 years still when Isaac died, okay? Uh, some of them um, in, uh, continue to live quite a while. Even Joseph lived quite a while, okay, down in Egypt. So, I mean, the body was, was made to be resilient, but you know what? When it's done, the soul leaves the body soul leaves the body. And when the life comes out of this body, my heart does not produce my life. My soul produces my life. Your soul produces your life. It's meant to live forever somewhere. Okay? It was meant to live with God. All right? Um, but sin, of course, destroyed that. And that's where we come to number two, spiritual death. The word in the blank is spiritual death. Spiritual death. Spiritual death is a separation of the soul from God. Separation of the soul from God. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, they became separated from God. Okay? Now, God did come back and talk with them one more time. They covered up. God made them coverings of skin. God gave them instructions. But that was the last time that God had the kind of relationship with Adam and Eve that he had originally had with them when he created them and the Garden of Eden. Now they're separated from God. Now they don't have the same relationship with God. And ever since that time, we have been experiencing spiritual death. Man has lost the presence and favor as well as the knowledge and desire of God. There is nothing that is um, spiritually alive in man. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and uh, that's where I want you to turn, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be here in a couple of verses. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, And you, speaking of the Christians there at the church at Ephesus, and you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our lifestyle, our behavior in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by, listen, nature, the children of wrath, even as others. And then, but God, okay, this conjunction and this change of thought in Paul's uh, writing here, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, there it is again, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, there it is again, hath quickened us, made us alive, there it is again, together with Christ, by grace, you're saved. And so the Bible says here, and in other, a lot of other places in Romans and, and uh, Colossians and various other um, places here in the epistles, the Bible says that we don't have the presence or favor of God, we don't have the knowledge or desire of God, uh, and we have to be made alive in God. There is no spiritual life in us. We are dead and we have to be made alive. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We walked according to the course of this world. We didn't walk according to God's will. We didn't walk according to God's righteousness. We walked according to this world. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We, we were all wrapped up in sin that uh, the world was doing, that Satan wanted us to do, um, uh, the spirit of disobedience, okay? Uh, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, those desires of the flesh, not desires for God, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. That's all we were um, capable of and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath. This is who we were, but God, in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy. Why? Because he loved us with his great love. Okay? Even when we were dead in, in sins. Okay? And then and the Bible says this in Romans, right? 5, 8. But God commendeth, God showed us his love. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was nothing lovely about me, nothing lovely about you. There was nothing that would merit us God's love or God's mercy, God's favor, God's grace. There was nothing that would have done that. But he showed it to us anyways. He showed it to us anyways. Okay. 
And so <clears throat> we have experienced physical death every time you go to a funeral. Remember, that's because of sin. We experience spiritual death, and people are walking around us every single day in darkness, um, in spiritual blindness, but they're also not alive spiritually. They're not alive spiritually. You try to talk to them about spiritual things, or I like it when, <clears throat> when I say like, it's an interesting term, I don't mean like it. Uh, it's interesting, I guess, when somebody who's not saved wants to engage me in spiritual conversation. They, they just, uh, you know, they, they, sound, they sound kind of foolish, okay? Because, the, in fact, the Bible says they are foolish. Their foolish minds are darkened, the Bible says, okay? They can't understand the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. Um, they might know a little bit of Sunday school. Uh, they might know a little bit about what grandma taught them. Uh, they might have studied something in school um, or heard something somewhere else or on TV or read something, but they don't have any spiritual understanding whatsoever because they're not alive, okay? They're not alive. Um, we're all born dead spiritually. And then if we continue in that state, then the Bible says we will experience eternal death. Number three, eternal death. That is eternal separation of the soul from God. So when sin entered the world, we experienced physical death. And because of physical death, our soul separates from our body. This body dies. Okay, this body dies. So we are then spiritually dead. Everybody that's been born since Adam has been born with a sin nature. Spiritually dead apart from God has to be made alive, quickened. Okay? And then if we continue in that spiritual death, we go on to eternal death. Eternal separation of our soul from God. When I preach this at funerals, I always mention the fact that death in, I'm sorry, that, um, uh, yeah, death in one word is separation. Separation of my soul from my body is physical death. And separation from God for all eternity, who God is our life. God is the source of eternal life. He gave us our soul. He gave us that life. And so we will be separated from God for all eternity in the lake of fire. Okay. This is, the Bible says, the second death. The second death. And so death is separation. And that's what Paul is really saying here. Uh, when I, I want you to look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> well, I'll start in verse 5. We'll give you some context. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. He's talking about judging. Um, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God, listen, to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they have not submitted themselves to that gospel, who shall pardon me, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You see there, they're going to be punished with everlasting destruction. And Paul brings this out from the presence of the Lord. Okay. They are separated from God. Okay. <clears throat> this is what is spoken of as the second death in Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. Okay. This is that eternal death. Um, when the Bible talks about eternal death here, of course, we're talking about people in hell right now, okay? And we believe that one day the Bible says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, okay? Which is another technically different place. We talked about this in the um, last module we did on uh, eschatology. But these words that Paul uses here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and especially in verse 9, who shall be punished, you got a word there, punished, which is actually two different Greek words, and you've got everlasting destruction. Destruction is a word as well, but these words are only used here in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, and 9. Actually, um, uh, there's three other places where destruction is used, um, the word that is used for destruction. This word destruction means ruin, death, punishment. Um, it's in the accusative tense. Uh, the word for punished is actually two different Greek words that are used here. Um, and this is the only phrase, uh, only time this phrase is used in here. But when it's used in classical Greek literature, it's always meant to be paying a penalty. Okay. This word is in the future active. Okay. The future active, which means it is sometime in the future and it's active, which means it's always going on. Okay. It's always going on. That word punished. 
Okay, the word punished here is, is the word for penalty. It's the word for punishment. It's always the word that's used to pay a penalty uh, that is ongoing. Uh, another uh, different, um, almost the same word, but a little bit different is used in Philemon chapter 1, of course, verse 19 there, where Paul says that if, the, if uh, Onesimus owes anything, he will repay it. The same type of word is used there uh, for this particular word, punished. It talks about the penalty, and that's why I bring it out here, because this is the regular phrase in classical Greek literature for paying a penalty that is ongoing and never stops. It doesn't denote annihilationism. It's used in the same sense in which the word which we say that a thing is destroyed, like my health has been destroyed because I got sick, or um, it's used in the same sense when property is destroyed or something like that. It's not totally gone. It's just it's, it's useless, okay? It's being ruined in the sense of ruin. And it's in the coming age that they will suffer separation from the Lord, okay, is what it's, take, it's talking about here, who shall be punished in this coming age when Jesus Christ comes back. They're going to be punished with everlasting destruction in a place called hell. Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, where he used the word everlasting punishment, not conditional chastisement, um, this word in the Greek language um, is the only word that we would have to denote this, then Jesus would have understood that, okay? That, you know, the majority of his people that would be listening to what he's talking about and then using the word ionios, okay, for eternal um, and everlasting, uh, this is the word that it would be the only word that would be um, used for designating life that would be never ending, okay? It's used for eternal life, and it's used for eternal death as well. Uh, without beginning, without end, that is the word ionion, ionios, in the Greek language. And so uh, there is a physical death, there's a spiritual death that is ongoing, and if we continue on with the spiritual, it is going to culminate in eternal death as well. All right. <clears throat> Next week, we will meet once again for prayer meeting and elective, although um, we won't be going over Hallmark Theology. Um, we will be doing a lot of um, different things with prayer, especially next week, okay? Um, so, and then we will start elective classes on the 24th.